Our scripture reading today is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, a lot has happened in the past weeks, and it can seem as if the world has been turned upside down. There are so many reasons that we might feel sad, frustrated, confused, perhaps even angry. We grieve the suffering that we have seen, the loss of life. We grieve the loss of jobs and the financial hardships and the uncertainty that so many face. We grieve the civil unrest and the violence. We grieve the racial injustices we have seen and the deep-seated pain, anger, and confusion felt by so many in the African-American community. Here in New York City, it can feel as if we're in a small boat being tossed around by the waves of a massive storm. Much of the city has been shut down by a virus which we don't yet understand and don't yet have an answer to. Many businesses not only are closed, but now they are boarded up in fears of being broken into or vandalized overnight. And even as stay-at-home orders are about to be lifted, now there's a citywide curfew in effect, the first in 75 years. The image that comes to my mind is from the Gospel of Luke, which we look at on March 29th, in which Jesus calms the storm. It's from Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. In the story, Jesus and his disciples get into a boat on the Sea of Galilee. And as they sail, Jesus falls asleep. And there is a violent storm that comes down on the lake, and the disciples fear for their lives. They go and wake up Jesus, saying to him, Master, Master, we are perishing. And Jesus wakes up. He rebukes the wind and the raging waves, and they cease, and there's calm. And Jesus says to them, where is your faith? And the disciples marvel at Jesus' power and authority. Who is this man that even the winds and the waters obey his commands? And much like the disciples, Christians need to be reminded anew that Jesus is in control and that we need faith, not fear. And specifically, we need to look at how the hope of the gospel speaks directly into our circumstances right now and shows us our greatest need, God's response to our greatest need, and the call to live in a new way. So let's start with how the gospel shows us our greatest need. If I could somehow sum up everything that has been, I've been thinking about over the past month in a single sentence, it would be this. The world is broken. There's a pervasive brokenness that runs through all individuals, that affects all our relationships, that all our communities and all our institutions are affected by. And we see this more and more clearly in the recent days as we see so many things going wrong. And there's a thread that seems to run through everything that we do. And we see this brokenness at every level of human life. There is social relational brokenness. We experience loneliness and alienation. We don't have the kind of relationships we wish we had. But more than that, we experience all kinds of enmity, strife, and division across difference. Rather than love for neighbor, first and foremost, we love ourselves and we protect our own interests. We wound one another intentionally and sometimes unintentionally 
perpetuating a cycle of ongoing hurt, anger, and pain that goes back perhaps for generations. And perhaps worst of all is that, it, is that we tend to blame others for the problems that we see, and we have difficulty seeing our own wrongs. And much of this is very subtle and unintentional. About 20 years ago, when I first became a Christian, I used to, to wear a cross, and I had a, that's when I had a lot of zeal for my newfound faith, and I wanted it to be visible. Well, one day, a stranger innocently asked me, what are you doing with that? And the person pointed to the cross I was wearing. And I didn't know what the person meant at the time, and so I didn't really have an answer. I simply smiled and shrugged my shoulders, and the person's friend said, oh, you can't say that and then politely walked away. And I thought nothing of it for some time. But what I didn't realize at the time, until much later, was that that brief encounter sowed deep seeds of doubt in my heart, that I didn't look like a person that should identify with Jesus. It was not rational, but something I experienced. And this was compounded by the fact that I'm the first Christian in my family, as far as I know, and I was the only Thai Christian that I, I knew at the time. And so I had my doubts. And there were subtle hints, not just from this encounter, but from many others, that to be a Christian was me trying to be someone that I'm not. Small, unintentional actions can cause deep and lasting wounds. And whether we realize it or not, there is social relational brokenness, especially across communities of difference, that creates separation distance and division. We are alienated from one another. But there's also psychological brokenness. We are not the people we wish we were. We experience anger, resentment, discontentment, and many other emotions that are not constructive. And we do the things we do not want to do, and the good that we want to do, we often can't. And so we are alienated from ourselves. But then there's physical brokenness. The world is marked by sickness, suffering, and death. This is not the world as God intended it to be. It is hostile to us and us to the world. We are alienated from God's good creation. And finally, there is spiritual brokenness. Our relationship with God is broken. We cannot love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the reason for this is that we distrust God. We doubt his goodness and love towards us. And if we were honest, we would rather be the master of our own lives than to entrust ourselves to the God who has given us everything. And this disconnect, this separation from God, creates a vast emptiness in the human heart, which continually longs for meaning, purpose, and worth in a world that cannot provide it apart from God. To be alienated from God means that we are estranged and cut off from him who is the source of all life, goodness, beauty, and meaning. We might compare this to what would happen if the earth was separated from the sun. The earth would grow dark, cold, and uninhabitable, and all life would wither and die. And in the same way, our broken relationship with God is ultimately the source of all other brokenness. To address this secondary issue without first addressing the cause is like a physician who treats the symptoms rather than the underlying root cause of the illness. It may give temporary relief for some time, but unless you fix the deeper problem, you can't be fully healed. And that's what the passage we read is about, as Paul writes about the ministry of reconciliation, that's at the very center of the gospel message. This is God's response to our greatest need. Paul mentions five times in verses 18 to 20 after telling them that those who are in Christ are new creation, he writes, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And so what is this ministry of reconciliation? Well, there's so much theology in this passage that we can't possibly unpack all of it in one sermon, so I'm not going to try. But let's look at two important aspects of the ministry of reconciliation. Let's look at the new perspective and then the new motivation. Faith in Jesus Christ gives us a new ability to see. 
So first of all, to be Christian means you see others differently. You see this in the first half of verse 16 in our passage, which says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. But what does that mean that we regard no one according to the flesh? Well, this is one of uh, the favorite expressions of the Apostle Paul. He uses it often. It means that we no longer regard, view, or judge anyone by worldly standards and by the values that derive from living as if this present physical life is all that matters. God created all men and women in his image and has imbued each one with equal worth and dignity. All people possess a basic human right given by God to be treated with respect. The ministry of reconciliation means that we not only are reconciled to God, which is our first priority, but it enables us to see others in a new way so that from now on, we don't regard anyone from a merely human viewpoint, but from God's viewpoint, which he reveals to us in scripture. And so let me be clear and read to you the excerpt that was sent in the email that was sent out on Friday. The idea that one race is superior to another is directly opposed by God who created all men and women in his image and has imbued, imbued each one with equal worth and dignity. All people possess a basic human right given by God to be treated with respect. Racism in all its forms is an abomination to God because it distorts, diminishes, defames, and destroys those whom God has created in his image. And both inside and outside the church, we have failed to live as if this is true. In light of all that has happened, the trauma and the turmoil that our nation is suffering, we invite you to join our entire family of churches within the Evangelical Presbyterian Church in a day of lament, fasting, and prayer tomorrow, Monday, June 8th. We also have prayer via Zoom led by elders tomorrow at 8 a.m., 12 noon, and 6 p.m. And why lament? Well, lament is a form of prayer that we see throughout the Psalms. Through prayers of lament, we express not only our frustration and sorrow, but our sheer inability to understand the suffering and the pain we experience in a deeply broken and divided world. We direct our lament to the God who knows and loves us in the sure and certain hope that he will heal us and renew our world. And perhaps this is to be yet another sign of new creation as we dedicate time, not for ourselves, but for the sake of Christ and for others. So to be in Christ means to be new creation. It means to see others differently. But secondly, new creation means that we see Jesus differently. And we see this in the second half of verse 17. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. The life of the Apostle Paul gives us such a clear example of this. You can read about Paul's conversion to Christ in the book of Acts chapter 9 and in Galatians chapter 1, which I encourage you to do. Prior to his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, Paul intensely persecuted the followers of Jesus. Paul was so zealous for God and such a law-observant Pharisee that it was his mission to destroy the church. For Paul, there was no way that Jesus could be the world's true Messiah. Jesus was crucified and died upon a cross, and such a person is considered cursed by God. But then one day on the road to Damascus, Paul encounters the risen Jesus, who appears to him as a blinding light. And Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And what we see here is that Jesus so identifies with his followers that he regards the persecution as against him. It's personal. Why do you persecute me? And through this encounter with Jesus, Paul's entire life is transformed literally from a destroyer of the church to one of the great builders of the church. That's new creation. Christians embody God's new creation in Jesus Christ. Heaven, the place of God's dwelling has broken into the world so that our true dwelling place, our true home, is no longer merely this physical world. New creation has dawned as if, and as if we live and we are able to live for the sake of Christ and for others. Now no longer alienated from God, we live as aliens and strangers in this present world. 
awaiting Jesus' return to make all things new. And that's the heart of the gospel. If anyone is in Christ, new creation. And finally, you see yourself differently. And you see this in verse 14 and 15. We have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all who live, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for their sake. And what does this mean? It means that Christians have died to the old way. The old way means living for ourselves. It means pursuing things like self-promotion, self-fulfillment, self-indulgence. It's having the view that my life is my own, therefore I do as I please. But as one commentator, Bible commentator uh, writes, ecocentricity has given way to Christocentricity. That means that having experienced the love of Christ through the power of God's indwelling spirit, the Christian is a new person transformed in the image of God seen in Jesus Christ. All those who are in Christ have died with Christ. God counts the old life as ended. And as a consequence of Christ's life is that we're freed uh, to live in a new way. This enables us to no longer live for ourselves, but for him who for our sake died and was raised. In other words, the more you experience the new creation uh, that has begun in Jesus Christ, the more you're able, the more that you are unable to selfishly live for yourselves. You see everything about your own life redefined by Jesus' death and resurrection. And so your values change, your priorities change, your hope changes, and the things that bring you happiness change because everything looks different. Everything looks different because everything is different. But faith in Jesus Christ not only gives us a new ability to see, but it also gives us a new motivation to serve. In his commentary on 2 Corinthians, Tom Wright gives us a helpful illustration on this new motivation. He writes this. He writes that there is a, a newspaper writer who covers a story of a young woman who has just won a competition, and the first prize is a three-week trip around the world, which she declines. It's a chance of a lifetime, but the young woman had given it up in order to stay with a friend as she went into the hospital to face a crucial and terrifying operation. And so the reporter asks, what on earth made you do that? I mean, surely she would have understood. There must have been other people who could have been there with her. But then the young woman remained silent, pursing her lips. Eventually, seeing that she wasn't going to go anywhere, she burst out, all right, you really want to know. You think I'm crazy, and none of you know this, and I wasn't going to tell you this, but this is what happened three years ago. This is what she did for me. I was on drugs, and I couldn't stop. It got worse and worse. My family threw me out. She was the only person who looked after me. She sat up all night again and again and again and talked me through it. She mocked me down when I threw up. She changed my clothes. She took me to the hospital. She talked to the doctor. She made sure that I was coming through it. She helped me with my court case. She even helped me get a job. She, she loved me. So did I have a choice? Now that she's sick herself, it's the least thing I can do is to stay with her. And that's far, far less than what she did for me. And as Tom Wright concludes the story, he writes this. He writes, the logic of love outweighs all other logic known to the human race. That sense of love, which changes everything and gives people the power to face things and to do things they wouldn't otherwise have done. That's what Paul is talking about in this passage. And Tom is referring to uh, verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. So why does Paul do what he does? Because such a powerful force compels him. Christ's love compels him to action, but it constrains him also. So it's almost as if he couldn't do otherwise, as almost as if he would say, it leaves me no other choice. The second person of the Godhead, the eternal son of God, through whom all things existed and were created, he emptied himself, took the form of the servant, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus did all these things so that you and so that I could be reconciled to God 
to belong to him, body and soul, now and forever. Sometimes Christians can think of their faith only in formal terms, using words like salvation, justification, and sanctification. But belonging to Christ, being a Christian, means so much more than merely being forgiven. The language of reconciliation is deeply personal. It's the language of friendship, loyalty, and love. Not our love, but Jesus' love for us. Reconciliation means that he has removed all the barriers of separation and enmity between us and God. And all this is from God, which is the beginning of verse 18, that God takes the initiative. He accomplishes the work of reconciliation, and therefore he will surely complete the task. Jesus enters into our world so that he could be our substitute, and so that he could take our place, the place that we deserved. He does this so that we can be, that he can remove all that separates us from God, especially our sin. Therefore, for your sake, God made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, have you experienced this life-transforming love of Jesus? Have you died to your old self? And can you see the beauty of all that Christ has done for you because of his love for you, because he loves you? And if this is true of you, then consider yourselves an ambassador for Christ, minister of reconciliation, who has been entrusted with a message of reconciliation. Therefore, friends, let us not live in the old way, because behold, the new has come. If anyone is in Christ, new creation, new creation. Let us therefore go forth to serve the world as those who love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, thank you that in the cross of Jesus Christ, you have shown your immeasurably great love for us. There's nothing in all creation that compares to how much you love us and all that you've done for us in your son, Jesus Christ. That while we were still sinners, that while we were still enemies of God, Christ would die for us. Help us to live with courage and joy that comes from the new life, the new creation that you give to us. Help us to see ourselves differently, to see Jesus differently, and to see others differently, that we might become your ambassadors, that we might make known your name and show forth your goodness to the world that so desperately needs it. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.